Shabbat Shalom, everybody. God bless you, and thank you so very, very much for joining us this morning for our Father's Seventh Day Sabbath. And thank you for keeping our Father's Seventh Day Sabbath, a day that he said would be a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations forever. Once again, everybody, I'm Pastor Scott Villain with Holy Impact Ministries, and we are back this morning with a, a very important study concerning the serpent of the Passover. Uh, and this is going to be a very interesting study. Uh, if you have never considered the work of the serpent during the Passover and how he is continuing that very same work today, even in our time, uh, you might want to stick around for this morning's study because this is going to be something that uh, I believe is going to be eye-opening for a lot of folks. Uh, you know, when we teach the Passover, we teach a lot of things, and we teach about all of the uh, good things that we have to look uh, forward to and the hope that we've been given and salvation and the Passover lamb and all of these good things. But we very rarely hear anybody teaching and preaching about the serpent of the Passover, the serpent and what he was doing uh, during that Passover, and why that's important to us. Why is it important for us to see what the serpent was doing during the Passover? Because he's still doing it today. He has not stopped doing it. And so, uh, once again, it is very important that we understand the tricks and the schemes of the evil one so that we can guard ourselves this Passover year. Uh, this is the top of the year. This is uh, God's new year, uh, new month. Uh, new year has just begun uh, this month, the uh, Passover here. Uh, we're just getting through to that. Again, coming up this Sunday will be uh, uh, the uh, uh, first fruits. And, you know, we're excited about all of these things, but we also have uh, a lot more to look forward as well. Again, God is going to be completing uh, his drawing of a, he, a Paleo-Hebrew Aleph across the face of this nation. That is coming this April 8th. We are being warned in so many ways. We have the Devil's Comet that is coming in uh, and should be able to be seen in the sky during that uh, eclipse. We have all kinds of things, wars, rumors of wars, all of these things that Yeshua said would be like the labor pains of a woman that are intensifying, 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 are indeed intensifying. Uh, the borders here in the United States are down. Crime and lawlessness is everywhere. What did Yeshua say? He said, uh, he said, Law because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many would grow cold. We see that happening right now before us. My friends, uh, we need to know and we need to understand what it is that we're up against. And we need to know and we need to understand that even during our Messiah's time, this war was being fought, this spiritual warfare that the Apostle Paul talks about in the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians, uh, is going on and will continue to go on until the Lion of Judah returns uh, in Zechariah chapter 14. And uh, once again, my friends, uh, you know, this is another side of the Passover that we would be uh, very remiss not to teach and not to bring to light. And so we want to do that today. We want to talk about some serious things, and we want to make sure that everyone within our assembly knows and understands how to protect themselves, how to put on that full armor of God that the Apostle Paul talks about in the sixth chapter of the book of e Ephesians. Uh, again, very, very important and very, 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 very vital information. So, before we get started this morning with that particular study, I would like to ask for prayers for uh, our beloved brother Tim. He was in surgery yesterday. He's got several other surgeries to go through. Uh, once again, if you've been with us uh, and following and tracking along, uh, brother Tim had a problem. He couldn't he couldn't eat, couldn't swallow anything. And there for a while, uh, he was just on a liquid diet. He hadn't eaten anything for over a month. He had lost a whole lot of weight. He went to the hospital. They put a stint in. That didn't work. Uh, and uh, they came back. And the doctor, according to the doctor, uh, that he has stage two cancer, esophageal cancer. And so uh, we know who the great physician is. And so we are praying. Uh, yesterday, Brother Tim went in, he had a J tube inserted. 
And so he is being fed. Hopefully now they'll be able to put some weight on him. He, he is getting just really nothing left of him because he hasn't been able to eat uh, for the last couple of months. And so uh, finally, he will be getting some nourishment to his body. Uh, and they're doing everything that they possibly can to turn this around. We need to pray for Brother Tim, uh, both senior and junior as well, and his family as well, Sister Rosemary, his wife, and everyone in the family. We need to pray for them, that they can know and understand that they are not alone and that we indeed are with them. And uh, we are going to pray for a healing, pray for a complete and total healing, pray for the doctors, uh, their hands to be touched by Yehovah God, that he may lead them and guide them in, in what they need to know and what they need to do to heal our brother Tim. If you would do that, my friends, I would be indebted to you. Uh, it is just something that... Uh, uh, it's just another sign this year is just bringing, uh, it's not bringing good things. Sister Judy, also, I wanted to mention her as well. She's been having to go to the doctor and have all kinds of tests run. She's been sick and not feeling well. Uh, they don't know whether it's a vitamin deficiency or something uh, wrong. Uh, she's going in for blood work to find out what, you know, what's going on. Uh, again, Sister Judy is one of those people within the ministry that goes all over the United States and, and to visit here and to visit brothers and sisters here and here and here uh, and she loves to go and visit and 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 bolster the faith of people uh, and she's sick right now and so we need to pray for her a very instrument instrumental uh, person within the assembly and so uh, if you would please pray for her again a healing there as well uh, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And pray for the assembly. There there are so many people out there who have ailments of one kind or another, uh, and they haven't said anything. A lot of people won't say anything until things really get bad. Let's pray for the assembly, and not just our own assembly. But let's pray for the true assemblies of God around the world, no matter where they are, no matter what state they're in, no matter what country they're in. Pray for our assembly, which encapsulates many, many more people than just people that are listening to this video at Holy Impact Ministries. There are many other ministries uh, that uh, are, are part of our brothers and sisters, and all of these ministries are, are going to be just brushed away. And we are going to become one assembly at the return of the Lion of Judah, who is Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek. Uh, and so uh, pray for your brothers, pray for your sisters, all of these little pockets of people now that are beginning to gather on their own and discuss the Bible and open the Word of God and talk about these things and test them to see if they be true or not. This is phenomenal, my friends. This is These are phenomenal days, and people are coming out of churchianity. They're coming out of, of the country club uh, church, and they are coming back to the Bible, and they're realizing, look, what you're learning sitting in a church pew for 40, 50 years is not the Bible. And again, uh, we've been preaching this for many, many years uh, here in this ministry. And we continue to preach it because we want people to know, look, if you're not reading the Bible for yourself, you cannot test the man standing behind the pulpit to see whether his fruit is good or rotten. If you're just listening to him and you're not reading for yourself and asking for the discernment that can only come from on high and no man, other than the man Yeshua, uh, then chances are very good that you will be sifted in these last days. This is some of what we're going to be talking about here today. This is, these are not times to play, my friends. It's not a joke. It's not a game. And we need to know that. We need to get very serious about what it is that we believe, and we need to audit our faith. Why do I believe what I believe? If you still believe in a Sunday, a Roman Catholic created Sunday Sabbath that's not commanded by anyone in the Bible, you need to ask yourself why you believe that. Who, who is your God? Who is it that you are honoring on Sunday when no one in the Bible anywhere ever commands anyone to keep holy the first day of the week Sunday and to call it the Sabbath? What are you doing? Why, why are you doing that? You better have a good answer, my friends, because time is short. And we are going to be held accountable for, uh, for the things that we do and for the things that we do not do as well. And so all of this is going to be encapsulated a little bit today in today's study when we start talking about the serpent of the Passover and the presence of the serpent during uh, the Passover. So uh, we're going to take a short break here for just a couple of minutes. When we come back, we're going to move right into the serpent 
of the Passover. If you've been ser- sitting in a church pew for any number of years, my friends, please stay with us. I think you'll be glad you did. Welcome back, everybody. Once again, thank you so very, very much for staying with us uh, this morning. It is a blessing uh, to be with you. Uh, Before we get started, I also wanted to make uh, a quick uh, kind of a service announcement, if you will. Uh, If you have been sending in questions to our email and you have not gotten an answer, please be patient. Uh, Passover week is a very busy, busy week for us. And so uh, we are not ignoring uh, your emails. We just want to let you know that. Uh, If you haven't gotten an answer back. Uh, I am surprised to find that most of the questions that we are asked uh, are have already been answered within our previous videos this week concerning the Passover. Uh, We've made, uh, this is the third video uh, that we will make. The first one is why the Passover was in March and not in April. Uh, this year. Uh, The second one that we did was just this past Wednesday, and it was a docu-study concerning uh, the greater exodus that is to come, not the one that has already come through Moses, but the one who is coming through the second prophet of God likened unto Moses. If you've never heard of that, you don't know about the greater exodus that is to come, and you don't know that God says during this next, uh, after this next coming uh, exodus, when he takes all of his people, people out of all the nations of the world. No one's even going to be talking about the uh, the exodus of Moses anymore because this second Moses is going to be on such a grand scale. He's not just going to be taking his people out of one nation. He's going to be taking them out of every nation on the face of the earth and bringing them back to him. Uh, and so once again, that was a tremendously important uh, kind of a docu-study. Uh, if you have not seen that this last Wednesday, you need to see it. And you need to understand, how does that pertain to the Passover? Well, how, do, how does that connect with the Passover? What's that all about? Uh, again, very important video. And today we're going to be talking about the other side of the coin. And not so much the blessings and the hope and all of the things that God has lavished upon us. But the other side of that coin, what do we, what does the Passover teach us that we need to do to protect ourselves and to protect our children and our children's children? 
And so this is what we're going to be talking about this week. So uh, once again, everybody, if you haven't gotten an answer uh, to your question uh, in the email, stay with us. We're going to get to to that. Uh, we have just been really locked up this week, and it's like that every year uh, around Passover. That's a normal thing. That's a good thing. We're, we're, we're not complaining about that. Uh, that is a blessing uh, for us. Uh, the, the kingdom of God is expanding as we speak. And that's very important. People see what's going on around. They're now paying attention. And this is the time to speak the truth and to help them to know and to understand how important it is to read the Bible and not just read it from Matthew to the book of Revelation, but to read it from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. If you don't know what's going on in the beginning, you're not going to know what's going on in the end because our Father in heaven teaches us the end from the beginning. And so if you don't know what's in the beginning, you have no clue what's going to go on in the end. It's just guesswork. Uh, unless you understand the beginning. And so that's why this is all very, very vital. And so, uh, with that being said, uh, this week being Passover week and with unleavened bread being upon us until tomorrow, we've done our best to teach and preach what our God-breathed Scripture and our God-breathed Scripture alone actually does proclaim, and just as importantly, what it does not proclaim. We started out this week talking about how to properly calculate the beginning of the Passover according to our God-breathed scriptures, and, and this is amazing. I still get people asking me in emails, whose calendar do you keep? Whose calendar? <laughs> we keep no one's calendar. That's the answer. We, we've already taught on this many times. We do not keep any man's calendar. We don't keep the rabbi's calendar. Again, the Pharisees. Uh, again, we're, uh, God, uh, Yeshua called them children of the devil. They, he said, you, you travel over land and sea to make one follower, and when you do, he's a twofold child of hell, more so than you are. Matthew 23, go read it. We don't follow the Hillel calendar. We don't follow the Gregorian calendar of the Roman Catholic Pope Gregory. We don't follow man's calendar. Please stop asking me that question. We've said it many times, and we say it again. We keep God's calendar. He wrote it in your Bible. If you don't know it, shame on you for not knowing it. Read the book. Please know, understand that God has his own calendar. And it's very simple. It's very simple, my friends. When you see a new moon hanging dark in the sky, you know that that is the beginning of Yahuwah God's month. It's just that simple. A day ends at sundown, and the new day begins at sundown. Not at midnight, at sundown, according to God's calendar. It's very simple. Once you know when that first new moon is and when the barley is green and it is the month of Abib, greening barley, you then know that this is God's beginning of his new year. And so all of his other feast days play off of that first new moon. All you have to do is count new moons to know exactly what month of God that you are in. Okay? So there's much to know here. And people ask me about, you know, all these Jewish names of the month. My friends... Most of the Jewish names of the month are pagan. They are pagan. The Jewish rabbis actually call the months of God by pagan names. My friends, Tammuz is pagan. They brought that up out of Babylon. Jehovah God says that his first month of the year is not Nisan. That's pagan. That's Babylonian. Deuteronomy chapter 16, it is the month of Abib. Greening barley. Greening barley. My friends, we need to come back to the Bible and stop, stop with all the nonsense that is in the world today. And this is some of what we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, again, this, these are the things that the serpent uses to sift God's people. It is written in the book of Deuteronomy that it is a sin to add to God's word. It's a sin to take away from God's word. You cannot do that without transgressing God's word. So when you are adding your own calendar, adding your own days, looking for a sliver that's nowhere found in the Bible anywhere, when you are doing these things and not keeping what God says to keep, and God alone says to keep, when you are keeping all of this man-made trash and garbage and filth that's been added to the Word of God, you are sinning. You are guilty. You are transgressing the law. I don't know how much more plainly that we can say it 
my friends. I, I don't know. I don't know what I, I mean. We shout it from the rooftops. It's that important. If we're not doing what God says, the Apostle Paul says that God's word is God breathed and it's profitable. It's profitable for, for again, for training in righteousness, for reproof and for correction. God's word. And when Paul spoke those words, he wasn't talking about the New Testament because the New Testament had not yet been written. Again, what scriptures was Paul talking about that were profitable for training in righteousness and for reproof? The Old Testament scriptures. Because it was the Old Testament scriptures that had all the qualifiers in them that qualified our Messiah to be our Messiah. That's why our Messiah said, everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Important? My, my friends, I tell you the truth, the serpent of the Passover is alive and well today in our time. What is God breathed? God's word, all of God's word. What does the Bible say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by what? 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 By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, most certainly, you could include the New Testament in that as well. But again, when Paul was speaking those words, he was speaking about the Old Testament that they had. That they had. The New Testament had not yet been penned. It had not been canonized. No one had a New Testament back in those days, my friends. And so we need to know that. We need to understand that. What, is, what, is, uh, what do the prophets tell us? That God teaches us the, the end. How does he teach us the end? From the beginning. From the beginning. If you don't know the beginning, you don't know the end. Important? Yes. 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 Wake up. Wake up. We need to send flyers out. We need to be shouting these things from the rooftops. Everybody needs to be reading their Bible from the book of Genesis. Forward. All of it to the book of Revelation. Many people say, I'm a Torah keeper. I'm a Torah keeper. Well, I'm a Bible keeper. I'm not a Torah keeper alone. I don't just keep the Torah. That's, in, that's what an unbelieving Jew does. I am a Bible believer. I believe in all of the scripture together. I believe in the whole story, not just half of it. And I challenge you to read that book for yourself, because I tell you the truth, my friends, if you read that book for yourself, and if you'll knock on his door, and if you'll ask, and you'll seek on his door, not a man's door, not some commentator, not some denominational empire of men, his door and his door alone, you will be given what it is that you ask and seek and knock for. But you have to knock on the right door, my friends. And that's what this is all about. And so our God breathed scripture and our God breathed scripture alone. And from that point in time, we moved on to talk uh, again about that greater exodus and how and why the greater exodus uh, to come has everything to do with our Father in Heaven's Passover and the Lamb that has, a, was, has anointed uh, has been anointed for the sins of all of us who would accept that anointed one. Did Yeshua come to die for the sins of the world? Yes, but did the world is the world going to accept that? What he came to die for, that gift that he got? No, no. Look around you. Look around you. Who's accepting it? Who's accepting it? When you see a camera shot of people walking down New York City how, and thousands and thousands of people filling the streets, how many of those thousands and thousands of people do you think actually accept the free gift of salvation that was laid out for them during the Passover? How many of them do you think actually have received the Passover lamb of God and know that he is God's Passover lamb and not God's Easter ham? How many people do you think know that? Many are called, but few are chosen. Not everyone. Many are called, but few are chosen. Straight is the gate, narrow is the path, and few there be that find it. Few, not many. 
few. There is a remnant, not the majority. A remnant people that God has saved for himself out of the world. That's what this is all about. Who are you? What do you believe? And why do you believe it? And that's what we are challenging you here today. To ask yourself, audit your faith. If you can't find it in the Bible, get rid of it. Throw it away. Take it to the curb for the trash man to pick up. This week we also spoke about God completing his promised new covenant by writing his law across our hearts and in our minds. And we talked in some detail about how God's new covenant was ushered in through the blood of God's Passover lamb. And we shared a communion service in remembrance of our Passover lamb, just like he asked us to do before he left, in order to go and prepare a place for us. But today, today I'd like to expound upon a rarely mentioned aspect of the Passover the reason why we have a Passover to keep in remembrance, and the reason that an innocent man had to lay his life down for the sins of us who could not do what he did. What most modern-day rabbis and pastors will not tell you is about the Passover serpent that caused God to create and establish and to ordain an event like the Passover. Why does the Passover exist? Why did God create it? Why did he ordain it? Why did he establish it? Why does he tell us to keep it in remembrance forever and throughout our generations? Why? Why? To this very day, that same serpent that tricked Adam and Eve in the garden is alive and well. He's not gone. He's not sleeping. That very same serpent that waged war on those who keep the commandments of God and those who hold to the testimony of God's Passover lamb is still waging that war. And although we have much to be thankful for this Passover season, the story of the Passover is not complete without mentioning the fact that the serpent that deceived mankind in the beginning is still alive and well and working during the Passover to this very day. He's alive and working this very week during Passover week. From year to year, we were long ago commanded by God to keep his Passover in remembrance so that we would not forget. But you see, our Father in Heaven didn't only want us to not forget that it was him that led our people out of Egypt. He didn't only want us to not forget that it was he that from the beginning had a plan to redeem us, but he also did not want us to forget that the serpent that was also doing its work all throughout God's original Passover is still a very viable threat to his people and will be a viable threat until his second prophet, likened unto Moses, returns. And that same serpent is still attacking God's Passover each and every year, year after year. That's why so many people don't keep it anymore. That's why even among those of us who do keep it, we can't seem to agree on when to keep it. Many years ago, the serpent deceived mankind into thinking that man could be his own God. Let's go take a look at this very quickly. Genesis chapter, three, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that Yahovah God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
From that very moment, the serpent has planted a seed in the mind of mankind that has flourished throughout the centuries until this very day. The idea that the human body is now somehow hackable and that man can be his own god and that man only needs to answer to himself and that do as thou wilt is now the whole of the law and that the Jesus of the church was teaching lawlessness are all becoming popular theologies and philosophical dogmas that are being taught all over the internet and even within the confines of our very own modern-day churches today. An important factor in all of this is that we need to understand that our flesh does not lead to life. And this is something that uh, the serpent is doing today that is gripping our children. It is, it is gripping adults who want to be like their Hollywood gods and goddesses or their music video gods and goddesses. We are to emulate the Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua. Not Iron Man and Superman and Barbie. Our flesh, my friends, this bio suit that we are wearing, does not lead to life. The wants and the desires of this flesh does not lead to life. And this biblical fact, when properly understood, can indeed serve us well in our battle against that serpent. Our sinful flesh will ultimately, if we allow it to, lead us directly down into the pit of hell itself where there is no light, there is no mercy, there is no grace, no redemption, no Passover lamb, and ultimately, no life. That's where this flesh will lead you. Listen closely to what the Apostle Paul had to say concerning setting our minds on the flesh. We can find that in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Again, turning to the book of Romans this morning, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. My friends, please highlight this in your Bible if you don't already have it highlighted. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But, but, to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. It can't. And therefore, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Why can't, why can't the flesh please, please God? Why, why can't we please God if we're, we're living according to what our fleshly desires want? Because according to Paul, the flesh cannot keep God's law. It cannot submit to God's law. It can't. Is that a big deal for Paul? Most certainly is. That's why the flesh leads to death, says the Apostle Paul. Are they teaching you that today in your modern-day uh, house of ill repute? It's important, especially during the Passover week, that we understand the battle that we are in. Because if we don't understand the battle that we're in, we're liable to not see that old serpent coming. And there's a very good chance that he will strike when we least expect it. From the moment man is born, man is born into sin. He's born under a curse, to be more accurate. Because from the beginning, man chose to worship the creature, the serpent, rather than the creator, God. Yahovah is his name. He wrote it in our Bible over 6,519 times. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Let's go read that. Let's stay, stay on solid foundation here this morning. 
Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And Yahovah, God, commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Why? For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, I want us to understand when we look at this, that when God speaks, whatever it is that leaves his lips becomes universal law throughout the whole of the universe. It becomes universal law. The words that leave the lips of God become universal law. And nature and the heavens and the earth all bow down in obedience because the universe knows and understands that God is God and there is no other like Him. When man decided to bow his knee to the serpent rather than to God, man was placed under the curse of death by God because God had already warned man. And because God had already warned man, and man chose to turn away from God and believe the the serpent instead of God, now all men who are born on earth are under a curse. A curse that comes from one man, Adam. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. Let's read that. Let's know it. Let's stand on some solid ground here this morning. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 19 says, And Adam, uh, and to Adam God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to the dust you shall return. It is for this very reason that every man that is born in human form is indeed born under that curse. And that man continues to stay under that curse until the very day that he dies and sheds his sinful flesh. Psalms chapter 51, verses 5 and 6. Let's read that. Psalms chapter 51, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. What is that inward being, that secret heart? What is that? That is your soul. That is your spirit. That is your essence, my friend. Not not the flesh. Not the flesh. You see, far too many pew warmers today do not understand the battle that they're in. They have no concept of the war that we fight because just like they cannot see the Father or the Son, neither can they see the serpent that continuously lurks in the shadows. Once again, listen closely to what the Apostle Paul says about the human flesh in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 18. Let's go take a look at that. Again, standing on solid ground, scripturally speaking. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 18 says this. Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual. We know that the law is spiritual. But I am a man of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So does Paul agree that the law is good? He absolutely does. We know that. In fact, James and the elders in uh, Acts chapter 21, I believe it's verse 24, tells us that Paul always lived in obedience of the law. That's Acts chapter 21, I believe, uh, verse 24. If you should read Acts chapter 21 and read about the trouble that the apostle Paul got into when he went to uh, Jerusalem to visit with James and the elders. If you don't know that story, uh, please, my friends, catch up, catch up. Go read it. 
Understand that Paul got in trouble for his teaching style because many of the Jews there believed that he was teaching against circumcision and teaching against the law of God. And according to James, he was not. And there, so James tells him to take these four men who are under a Nazarite vow and go and, and, and take these men and make sacrifices for them at the temple, which was still standing at that time. And that's what Paul did. Paul circumcises Timothy in Acts chapter 16. You know, don't, don't believe, my friends, everything that you're hearing from behind today's denominational pulpit without reading the book for yourself. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 7 verse 16? Now, if I do what I do not want... I agree with the law that it is good. So now it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. What is sin? According to John, sin is the transgression of the law. That's the biblical definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Let's continue. Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. My friends, if you don't have this highlighted, please highlight it, that you may know. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Once again, Paul enters the flesh into the equation. And just as Paul tells us here in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, there is nothing good that dwells in our human flesh. You see, the serpent, even during the Passover, had the ability to strike fear into the heart of Peter, which caused Peter to think that protecting his human flesh was much more important than protecting his soul. When Peter saw the Messiah being beaten and slapped and spit upon by the pastors of his time, by the way, the high priests, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes, when he saw all that taking place and someone said, I know that man, he's one of Yeshua's followers, what did Peter say? He was feared for his flesh. No, I don't know him, says Peter. The serpent had struck Peter with fear for his flesh. And it was the love of Peter's flesh that caused Peter to deny his very own Messiah and King, not once, not twice, but three different times before the rooster crowed. During the Passover season. Once again, it is written, What good is it if a man gains the whole world but loses his soul? And it is also written, Not to fear what man can do to the body, but what God can do to both body and soul by casting them both into the pit. And Peter's weakness because of fear for his flesh, Peter simply forgot those scriptures, and so he was sifted by the serpent that very day. Do you see how easily the serpent is able to sift man? And if he can do it to Peter, you better believe that he can do it to us if we do not have the full armor of God upon us, which is the word of God. But you see, that's what the serpent does. The old wise serpent has the majority of today's modern-day professing Christians so worried about their fleshly bodies, what they look like, and what they're wearing, and, 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 and all of this, and, and protecting their flesh, and staying alive in this world, that they never take into consideration the fact that it is written that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Does that not register with us? Flesh and blood, that's this bio suit we're wearing, cannot enter the kingdom of God. It cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Let's read that. It's standing on firm biblical ground. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15. Let's read that. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot enter in or inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What's perishable? Our bodies are perishable, my friends. They're just like fruit. A fruit is good, and it, and it, and it, uh, it produces life on the tree, right? But what happens when it gets old? It's perishable. It, it rots back into the ground to make a new tree, right? In other words, as long as you continue to live on this earth, in this fleshly body, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom. You know, it, it absolutely boggles the mind. Hollywood's uh, Left Behind series, all about the pre-tribulation rapture, right? And what do they show? They show clothes, and there's nothing in the clothes. There's just clothes there, like... God's going to take your sinful body to heaven. Right. What Bible are you reading? What Bible are you reading? They know nothing of the Bible. They know everything about making boatloads of money. Teaching. Heresy. In other words, my friends, again, and I just want to make this very clear to everyone, as long as you continue to live on this earth, in this fleshly body, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Because flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, can't inherit the kingdom of God. Keeping all of this information in mind, let's now go back to the beginning. I'd like to take us back to the beginning, because this is where God teaches us the end from. During the days of the original uh, Exodus, Moses came before the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he once again argued for the release of God's people. And when the Pharaoh of Egypt asked to see a miracle from Moses, from his God, Moses dropped his staff on the ground before Pharaoh. And do you remember what happened? Let's go, let's go read that in Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13, shall we? Let's go read that. Again, very quickly here, we're going to go over here to East Ward here, and we're going to read this in the book of Exodus chapter 7, verses uh, 8 through 13, says this, Then Yahovah said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as Yahovah commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers. And they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as Jehovah had said. You see, the devil had forgotten who it was that had created the serpent in the first place. Who was it that had total control of the serpent? The one who created the serpent. Even though the devil himself had the power to cause the staves of Pharaoh's sorcerers and magicians to turn into worthless serpents. They had no power over the serpent that God had created, and so they were swallowed up. And this is oftentimes how the serpent works, always dressing himself up in order to make man believe that he has power that he does not have. This is why he had the people of Egypt worshipping everything from bulls and cows to frogs and grasshoppers, none of which had any power at all whatsoever. The very same Passover serpent that did all that he could do to strike fear and doubt in the hearts and in the minds of Yeshua's apostles is still at work this very day, doing all that he can to cause our children to want to emulate what they see on the silver screen and what they hear on the radio instead of emulating the Lamb of God. You see, our children think there's power in being the bell of the ball. 
They think there's power in being the most scantily clad girl in class. They think there's power in being Superman, or Iron Man, or any kind of other man, instead of the man, Yeshua. Just look at our culture, look at our society. There's nothing different about what took place in Egypt with those stabs turning into serpents than what we see today in Hollywood in our music industry. They are nothing but serpents that in the end seem beautiful and powerful, but in reality have no power at all whatsoever and lead to nothing but death. Death. Our children find no value in themselves anymore. If they're not like Barbie, if they're not like Iron Man, if they're not the most handsome or the most beautiful person in the room, how ridiculous is all of this? You see, the serpent has been with mankind from the very beginning. During the Passover, that same serpent, serpent also known as Satan and the deceiver of the whole world, who accuses us both day and night before our Father in heaven, was even able to enter into the closest circle of the Lamb of God. Think about that. Well, who, who was the, the closest circle of the Lamb of God? It was his apostles. He was so sneaky, so quiet, so subtle that he was able to enter in the closest circle of the Lamb of God. Not once, not twice, but several times over. You see, the first Passover season, the serpent entered into Judas Iscariot, who betrayed the Lamb of God with not just words, but a kiss of all things. And that same serpent caused Peter to fear the serpent more than he feared God when Peter flat out denied Yeshua three different times before the rooster crowed. And again, the serpent was there casting fear and doubt into the hearts and the minds of the apostles who all doubted that Yeshua, who, that you, who Yeshua was after his death. Remember, how many, how many witnesses came to the tomb and saw that the body was gone and came back and reported, and the apostles wouldn't believe it? They were still in hiding because they didn't want anybody to know that they were a follower of Yeshua. They were in hiding, and they were. And when they had more than one witness come, what does the Bible say? Any anything must be proven by two or more witnesses. They had two or more witnesses came. They didn't believe it. That is until Yeshua finally showed himself and allowed doubting Thomas to feel the holes in his hands and to physically reach up into his rib cage. And Yeshua shamed them for that. Who had done that? The serpent. Did Yeshua not tell his apostles over and over and over and over and over again what must take place and that he would be crucified and that he would have to suffer by the hands of the Pharisees and the high priests and the pastors, the men of God? Yes, he told him over and over and over and over. Anybody who's been with us throughout our Bible studies knows how many times Yeshua told them what he was going to do. He did it, and they were oblivious. Everything that he said came to pass, and they were just dumbfounded. Didn't get it. Where, where does that dumbfoundedness come from? My friends, where does that come from? The slithering serpent. Yeshua had both a physical father whose name was David and a physical mother whose name was Mary. Yeshua had all the chromosomes he needed in order to be a fully human man created by the very hand of God himself. Not says I, but says our God breathed scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Let's look at that standing on solid ground. Again, not veering away from what the Bible says, but standing on what it does say. 
2 Samuel chapter 7, this is God speaking to David. He says, David, when your days are fulfilled and when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, your bowels, David. And I will establish his kingdom. Friends, anyone who tells you that Yeshua did not have both a human father and a human mother is nothing short of a blatant and unadulterated liar. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. The very first sentence of the New Testament proclaims that Yeshua had both a human mother and a human father. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Let's go read that. First sentence of the New Testament. What's it say? Let's take a look at it. The book of the genealogy of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We all know he was born of Mary. And we all know who he was the son of. Any questions about that? Please, my friends, do not fail this test. It is an important portion of the Bible to understand because the serpent has worked wonders over the ages when it comes to skewing, to smearing, to distorting, and even hiding the true identity of our Messiah and King from God's people, who now believe that they, can, they can't keep the commandments of God, and that they can't, they can't be obedient anymore. And so how do we think that Yeshua broke that curse of death? over mankind that we just read about in Genesis. How did, he, how, did he, how did he do that? Again, by getting us to follow him down into the watery grave of baptism, which symbolizes our death to the world and being raised up a new creature with the drive and the desire created by God to know God and to come back to Him. How do we think that Yeshua broke the curse of death over mankind during the Passover? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. I'd like to read that very, very quickly here. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews. Tons of information in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Uh, excuse me, what, 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 what? Please highlight this in your Bible, my friends. If you don't already have it, hide it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God, would taste death for every man. My friends, why did Yeshua have to die on that cross? What was the purpose, purpose of his physical death? Let me ask you this, my friends. What's the difference between this? You see this? This is Moses standing there with a post with a snake nailed to it. You see that? What's the difference between this and this. Do you know? You see, when Yahuwah God sent serpents to attack the house of Israel because of their disobedience in the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers, he told Moses to raise up a serpent on a pole, which is a representation of sin and transgression, destroyed and where sin and transgression leads to. That's what the snake on the pole represented. And he told Moses that every one of the Israelites who was bitten by a serpent that day would live if, if they looked upon the serpent on that post and saw the destruction of that serpent and saw their own sin and their own transgression on that post. If they saw that serpent, which represents sin and transgression, being slaughtered on that post, then they would live. 
That serpent upon that post represented the people's sin and transgression. And when the people looked at that serpent on that post and saw their own sin and their own transgression for, for what it was and where it would lead them, then they lived. You didn't look at the serpent on the pole, you died. If you didn't know what your sin and what your transgression leads to, you died. Anyone who did not look at that serpent on that pole died. Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, literally became the same sin that that serpent on the pole represented. He who knew no sin became the sin of the world. You see, this is why it is written that it was God's will to crush Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek. Did you know that? Oh, oh you'd ne you've never heard that it was God's will to crush Jesus before? Huh. Apparently have not read Isaiah chapter 53. Let's go read it. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 9 through 10, says this, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of Yahuwah to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of Yahuwah shall prosper in his hand. He who knew no sin became sin, my friends. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In order to be sure that we are understanding exactly what took place upon that cross during the Passover, we need to examine Hebrews chapter 5. Have you ever read Hebrews chapter 5? Let's go take a, a look at Hebrews chapter 5, which puts it all together very nicely for us. We're going to go over here very quickly. I want to take you over to Eastward for this one. Hebrews chapter 5. Here it is. Let's read again. Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. Stop. Stop. What? What does that say? For every high priest, every high priest chosen from among who? From among angels? No. From among uh, uh, other worldly aliens? No, no, no. From uh, uh, chosen from God's heavenly host? No, no, no. Every high priest chosen from among men. In other words, you have to be a man in order to be a high priest. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Why is he beset with weakness? Because he's a man. That's why he's a man, just like, the, that's just like they are. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does those of the people. Does, does a, a high priest offer sin for himself? Absolutely. That's what the Day of Atonement's all about. A high priest had to uh, offer a bull for the remission of his own sins before he could ever even think about offering the two goats for the house of Israel for the atonement of their sin. Again, this all goes back to the beginning. God teaches the end from the beginning. If you don't know this, then you are slighted and, and, and you are oblivious. And you're just left wondering. Again, go back. Read the, the Day of Atonement. Understand what the high priest did before he did anything else. He had to make a sacrifice for his own sin first. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. My friends, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4. Again, Yeshua did not take this honor for himself. He couldn't. The only way that you could take this honor is if you were called by God just as Aaron was. Let's continue. So also the Messiah did not exalt himself to be made a high 
priest. Did Yeshua exalt himself to be made a high priest? Was he already a high priest? As the church loves to teach. No, my friends. It says right here in Hebrews chapter 5 that the Messiah did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. My friends, I have heard all kinds of uh, linguistical lawyers trying to do all kinds of theological gymnastics to get out of that one. But here it is. And no matter what, my friends, you cannot add to God's word or take away from God's word. God's word is God's word. And what it says, it says. Let's read it again. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Where is that other place? The book of Psalms. David wrote about it. In the days of his flesh, Yeshua offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Yeshua cried out to God who was able to save him. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. My friends, don't let anyone ever tell you any different. Do not let any wolf in sheep's clothing tell you any different. In the days of his flesh, Yeshua offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him, God the Father, who was able to save him from death. And he was heard. Why was he heard? Because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Did he already know obedience, my friends? Did he already have obedience? No. It's right here in your Bible. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect by learning obedience through what he suffered, he became, was he already the source of eternal salvation? No, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, my friends, I'm going to read this next paragraph, and I want you to pay close attention, because this is to the church today. Paul says about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's still a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. My friends, are we distinguishing good and evil in the church today? Does it sound to you like the church is teaching Hebrews chapter 5? I'll let you answer that question. According to Paul, this is the milk of God's word. Let's go even a bit further concerning who this man Yeshua was and how it was that he was able to do what he did. Hebrews, I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm going to read 1 through 7. Hebrews chapter, or I'm sorry, 7 through 9. I want to read 7 through 9, so let's scoot up here. Hebrews chapter 1, 7 uh, uh, through 9 says this. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a, a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God. Now, this is, this is God the Father speaking to Yeshua, the Son, the Lamb of God. Listen to what he says. But of the sun, he says, pay attention. Your throne, O God. Is, is God calling Yeshua a God? He most certainly is. It's right here in Hebrews chapter 1. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of uprighteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, and you have hated wickedness. Therefore, because you have loved righteousness, and because you have hated wickedness, therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Did you catch that? 
Does God the Father call his son a god? You just read it. When Timothy, or doubting Thomas, when he reached into the ribcage, right, of, of Yeshua, he, what did he say? My God, he says. Was he wrong? No. Does this mean that Yeshua is God the Father? No. No. We just got done reading. Yeshua had to learn obedience. He didn't, he didn't know obedience. He had to learn obedience through what he suffered. Yeshua cried out with tears to his Father, Help me! Save me! And he was heard by his Father because of his reverence. Your throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Let's take a look at another scripture, shall we? we take a look at another scripture? Let's take a look at another scripture that corresponds with that scripture. Let's take a look at this. Psalms, chapter 82. Is, are there more than one God in the Bible? Yes. Here it is, Psalm chapter 82. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. What does he say? He says, I said you are God, Son of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, in other words, you're not men, but you're going to die like men. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. What's going on here? Again, God is sitting within the confines of his divine council, who he calls gods. That word in the Hebrew is Elohim. Now, mind you, there is only one most high Elohim. But there are many Elohim that can be found within the confines of our Bible. Let me read this whole thing to you. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. How long will you just unjudgely and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. He's, he's chastising these, these gods that he put in charge of the nations. And he's telling them, I said you're gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Get that, my friends? Let's take a look at another corresponding scripture here. Red letter words from our Messiah. Did he believe that there are other gods in the Bible? He cer we certainly did. He points right to this. Where does he point to this at? Well, let's go take a look here. Let's go take a look here. What does Yeshua say here in John chapter 10, verse 34? Yeshua answered, now I want to read, let's back up here and read uh, John chapter 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him, for it is not good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, did they know he was a man? They most certainly did. He most certainly was. They knew he was, right? He says, we're going to stone you because you being a man, make yourself God. And here's Yeshua's reply. Listen closely. Yeshua answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said I'm the Son of God? <laughs> Again, these so-called pastors and priests of his time, the so-called men of God, they didn't know their own Bible. They, they didn't have no idea. Yeshua says to him, is it not written in your law? I said, you're gods. And if he called them gods to who, who the word of God came, the scripture cannot be broken. He says, you're getting all over me because I say I'm the son of God. Are you kidding me? You don't know about the gods, that are, the God, uh, the God's divine counsel in the beginning of the Bible? They had no clue. They were no, do you think of the priests and the pastors today know about God's divine counsel? Hell no, they don't know anything about it. They don't know anything about it. Nothing. People say, well, well, then you say we're not a monotheistic religion. Christianity is not a monotheistic religion that believes in one God. We are a monotheistic religion that believes in one God. Just because there are other gods that are before God, there is none 
like the Most High God. He is the general, if you, the president, if you will. Uh, the, all these other gods below him are like generals. Okay, they, there is a again there there is a uh, a structure, a command structure here found within the Bible. The Bible, God is very clearly clearly tells us all that there is no other God like him. He is the Most High, the El Elyon, the Most High God. But are there other gods under him? Yes. Yes. And again, if you don't believe that, again, go read Nebuchadnezzar. Who, who was it that commanded Nebuchadnezzar to wander out in the fields for seven years? It wasn't God. It was the watchers of God, the holy ones of God. Did commanded Nebuchadnezzar to be turned into a beast and roam the field. Again, my friends, this all comes from reading your Bible and knowing and understanding your Bible, which the serpent does not want you to do. He wants you to sit in a denominational church pew and be stupid. That's what he wants you to do. It's just that simple. I can't say it any other way. He wants you to just be ignorant. Sit in the church pew. Listen to what my minister tells you as he fills our heads and our hearts with all kinds of demonic, non lawless nonsense. The point in all of this is that the scriptures are clear when it comes to our human flesh, just as Jehovah God had told Adam and Eve. Our human bodies, because they are under the curse of death, will indeed return to the dust of the earth in the end. But we, in spirit form, just like our Messiah and King, will continue on if, if we belong to the Lamb of God. Belonging to the Lamb of God is essential to our leaving these human bodies behind. We don't want these human bodies. They can't inherit the kingdom of God. We must move on out of these. We must remember that we still have an accuser, my friends, that is, looking to accuse us of wrongdoing before our Father in heaven each and every day. Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 9. Let's go read that. For, again, standing on biblical ground, my friends. Biblical ground. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 says this. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of our Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. My friends, think of it this way, this, this season. We're moving into a very hard time. This, is, this isn't, this isn't time to play. It's not time to Google Gaga. It's not time to tiptoe through the tulips. It's time to speak the truth. And here's the truth, my friends. Think on this. If someone were watching you both day and night, everywhere you went, even in the most private of places. What could that accuser accuse you of before the Lamb of God? Think about that. Seriously, think about Only you know the answer to this question. Think about that. It's not just about who we are in front of others. It's about who we are behind closed doors. God hates a hypocrite. My friends, if you're different behind closed doors than you are in front of people, then you're a hypocrite. If you're teaching to not be lawless, or, yeah, not be lawless, and you yourself are lawless, you're a hypocrite. You know, the Pharisees, and the, who were the pastors and the priests, the popish leaders of Yeshua's time, he, he, called, he had all kinds of pet names for them. He called them, two, he called them a brood of snakes. He called them twofold children of hell. He called them whitewashed tombs that were beautiful on the outside, but full of dead men's bones on the inside. He said, you guys, you travel over land and sea to make one father when you do. He's a twofold child of hell. More He called all, all kinds of names, but he called them one name over and over and over and over again. Do you know which pet name that was? The one that he called them the most? 
Hypocrite. Hypocrite. My friends, if you allow the serpent to turn you into a hypocrite, he will sift you. You know, I can remember many years ago, and this, this might seem kind of funny, but many years ago, when I was just a boy, my mother, before she came to the knowledge of the truth, right, she once told me that Santa Claus was always watching me and that Santa Claus would know whether I had been naughty or nice. Now, today, you might say, well, that was a lie. But I tell you the truth. There's no difference between the lie of a Roman Catholic created Santa Claus and the devil himself, who is the father of all lies. They're equally lawless, they're equally shameful, and they both lead to sin and to transgression. I tell you the truth, my friends, the accuser who is the serpent is alive and well today, and because he knows that his time is short, he's not only watching, he's not only uh, just standing around lurking in the shadows, but he's instigating, he's antagonizing, he's suggesting, he's pushing whispering things into our ears and running through, rampant through our minds in order to get us to put our hands to the plow and serve him instead of him, God, so that the serpent can accuse us of turning away from God just like Adam did. I tell you the truth, my friends, the Passover serpent that deceived Judas and Peter and the rest of the apostles with fear and doubt is wonderfully brilliant, and we need to know and we need to understand that he is wonderfully brilliant. For he has over the ages sifted billions, if not trillions, of souls. And if you are a true God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christian, know this. You have a target on your back this season. You are a trophy piece to that accuser. That serpent wants you more than he does anyone else because he knows that if he can sift a child of God, he's got something to rub in God's face. My friends, don't be that tool of the serpent. As time marches on and the serpent knows that his time is getting shorter and shorter, it is written that his wrath will wax hotter and hotter. And we who this serpent has declared war upon need to know and to understand that our human bodies are indeed expendable. Now that's a tough pill to swallow, my friends, but that's the truth. Your flesh is expendable. This is why it is written, Do not fear what man can do to the body, but what God can do to both body and soul by casting them into the pit. In other words, God does not care about our sinful flesh as much as he cares about our souls, our spirit. The sinful flesh returns to the dust of the earth. It is our souls that continue on. And therefore, we should not look at death with the same darkness that others do. God would not have given a suit of full armor to his children if he didn't expect them to march into battle and to get into the fight. And in these last days, as the gray area is being removed from the equation and we are all being forced to choose one side or another, we all need to understand the gravity of the times that we are now living in and prepare for the long haul so that the serpent that we see doing his works in God's word is not given a foothold in our lives. I hope and I pray that that makes sense to you. I hope and I pray that that is something that you will take to your prayer closet and test through the fire of prayer. Before we close this morning, I'd like for us to examine one more scripture that has to do with the blood of, and I quote, that one man. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. Let's go take a look at that uh, very quickly here. 
Very important scripture. Romans chapter 12. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 5, 12 through 19. Let's read this together. Therefore, just as sin came into the, the world through one man, who's that one man? That one man is Adam, right? Let's read that again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, where did death come from? From sin, right? What is the wages of sin? Again, the wages of sin is death. Let's read that again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Who was Adam a type and a shadow of? Again, God teaches us the end from the beginning. Adam was a type of the one to come, who was Yeshua. Let's continue. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace by that one man, Yeshua the Messiah, abound for many. Did Paul know that Christ was a man? He most certainly did. He says so right here. A man. Was Adam a man? Yes. Was Yeshua a man? Yes. Says who? Says the Pope of Rome? No. No. Says some rabbi? No. No, no. Says the Bible. Says the Apostle Paul. Says these God-breathed scriptures. Let's continue. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned throughout or through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Are we picking up on this, my friends? I've, I've, I've taken the liberty, for those of you who uh, are listening to this by video, by highlighting in green every time it says one man, one man, one man, one man. This is all done by one man, my friends. Let's continue. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Does that make sense? I hope and I pray that it does, my friends. There is so much to know and so much to understand about the serpent of the Passover and the works that he did during the times of the Passover. But my friends, here's what you need to know above and beyond all. Let's take a look at this next scripture, which is very important. Once again, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, the Messiah, Yeshua who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. My friends, I hope and I pray that this sheds a little bit of light on what the serpent was doing during the Passover. Why, we, why it is that we even have a Passover is because of the serpent in the first place, right? Evil, again. And the uh, ability that we have to distinguish between good and evil can only be given to us by him. What is truth according to our Messiah? The word of God. This is why it is written that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word, not some word, not this word or that word, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
How well do we know every word that proceeded from the mouth of God? How, how, how well studied are we in what has proceeded from the mouth of God? Not from the mouth of men. Not from the mouth of some commentator. That, that, that's not our bread of life. The word of God is what feeds us, what sustains us, and what leads us to life. You either know it, or you don't. My friends, what we've said here is going to become monumentally important in the days to come. This is a war that we fight. This is not a joke. It's not time to all hold hands and sing kumbaya. It's not time to assimilate ourselves with the world. It's time to set the evil man outside of the assembly and get down to business. It's time to protect the assembly of God. It's time to shun those who are full of sin and degradation. Not to join hands with them. And lick the boots of the serpent. My friends, hold on tight. With that being said, I would like to ask everybody within the sound of my voice to once again take what you've heard here to your own prayer closet and bow your knee and, 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 and bow your head and bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you've heard here today be true or not. Ask, seek, and knock on his door and his door alone so that the proper door can be opened unto you. And my friends, if you will do that, and if you will stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together. I'm Pastor Scott Villain with Holy Impact Ministries, and once again, uh, I would just like to say thank you so very much for lending your ear to me here uh, this morning. These are difficult words to get out. They're difficult, difficult things to say. Uh, they're, we're in a, in a state of emergency here, my friends. This is not a joke. We don't have time for niceties and for coddling. Uh, just as Paul tells us, look, you ought to be teachers by now, and here you have to be taught the milk of God all over again. That's us. He's talking to us. And we need to know these things. We should have already known these things. And we're behind the eight ball. We're trying to catch up. And so please, my friends, please, my friends, read the Bible for yourself. Read it for yourself. Knock on his door and ask him to help you with your understanding. He will bless you abundantly. Abundantly. Gather together with yourselves, not sitting in a denominational church pew, but sitting in an assembly, talking, conversing with one another. Talk to your brothers and sisters about what they have read, what God has delivered to them. Share, take, give, and take. That's where we grow, my friends. That's how it's done. Not sitting in a church pew listening to one guy ramble on about his denominational dogma. Again, my friends, we're part of an assembly. We are all to be made one. The pastor is not a god. Please, my friends, understand these things this year. Come together. Join an assembly that talks in, about the Bible and shares ideas and shares what did, what did God share with you? What, what do you get from this? But oh, how does this scripture add into that? How does that? How do you reconcile that? You know, talk about these things. Ask God to be with you. Pray in your assemblies, and, and God will give you an abundance of information, my friends. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't think you've got to have four years of seminary from some brick-and-mortar building. Read your Bible. Get on your knees. Get his diploma, my friends. That's the diploma you want. That's the only one you need. Okay, enough said. I'll just keep on going. I am just so impassioned about this, my friends. I, I, can't, I can't help it. Again, we're in a state of emergency. We need to get with it. Uh, with that being said, everybody, let's say a quick prayer here, and then we will, I will let you adjourn uh, for your seventh-day Sabbath, and we can, again, relax. 
In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all names. We thank you, Father, so very much for the message that you've given us here today. We thank you for once again calling us calling us back to your word. Thank you for pouring out your spirit upon your people. Thank you, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, for once again giving us this word of God, this compass that we have to lead us and to help n us navigate through the dark times that we are now living in. Yeshua, please, we pray another measure of your Ruach HaKadosh upon us is what we need. Your tenacity of the Lion of Judah to stand fast and hold the line as we march into battle against things that are not true, against deception, against darkness, while we push back. Messiah Yeshua, again, be with us. Help us to know when to speak and when not to speak, when to move, where to move, how to do things. Uh, we ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that you would continue to pour out your spirit upon us, that we may have the power to go out and do as it is that you would have us to do. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we see what you are doing this coming April 8th, we know that it is you because there is no one in the universe that could do what you are about to do this April 8th. We see you. We hear you. Let us be obedient to you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we love you. All right, everybody. We will see you next time uh, again. Uh, we will be back this next coming Wednesday. We'll talk more, a little bit more about our regular Bible studies, and we'll probably be getting back into uh, those again. And uh, we will be expounding upon what it was that our Messiah wanted us to know and uh, what it is that the Bible says and what the Bible does not say. We'll see you next time. Shabbat Shalom, my friends, and happy first fruits.